بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Dear colleagues, I'd like to welcome you in this evening webinar uh, on this uh, day, the 28th of uh, September, which is uh, signed by UNESCO as the International Day for Universal Access to Information. Uh, it's uh, very critical in this age, the age of information, that all the humanity have access and have the right to access information wherever they are, whatever is the because it is a right like the, the air, the air we are breathing, like the, the clean water that we are drinking, and it becomes more and more important to access information because everything is built on information in your daily life in your business in anything you do you need information if you have the right information you can make the right decision uh, if you don't you may end up in trouble or you may end, uh, you may end up uh, doing the wrong thing and uh, you are think it's the right thing to do uh, thanks to Oman Library Association for rising up this opportunity for us to speak to one of our professional librarians in the field from the region. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Dorian Lang. She is, uh, is, she is going to be our speaker tonight. I will give a short introduction about Dr. Lang and then I will ask her to introduce herself to us so that we, we, can, we will get familiar to her before, we, before she starts speaking. Uh, Dr. Dorian is uh, uh, currently she is the library manager at the Middlesex University in Dubai. She has worked as the librarian for about 20 years. Uh, during which she has uh, worked in different uh, capacity in the library. She is uh, originally from the United States and uh, did her uh, PhD in uh, information science with a uh, subfield in nuclear engineering and journalism. Wow. Uh, and she has uh, master degrees in international relations and uh, information science. I would like to welcome you to Dorian, uh, tonight with us in this webinar and hopefully that uh, we'll have more uh, uh, participants or more uh, colleagues jo joining us as we go because you know it's uh, I know that the time different from city to city makes people a little bit uh, infused to, to, uh, to come in at the right time having and there is a time, different time zones, so that uh, you sometimes you don't figure out the, the, the exact time. Uh, welcome, Dr. Dorian. Can you tell us more about yourself? Oh, of course. Thank you so much, Dr. Saif. And thank you to the Oman Library and Information Association. Thank you to all of you for joining us for this talk. It's such an important topic, and I'm so delighted that we can discuss it here together. I have been working in libraries for a very long time, since the last century, in fact. I first started in libraries as a freshman in college, first year college student, and I was shelving books, shelving books, and making books were in the right order. And there's just a piece in libraries that I think we all find and know and love. And so I decided to dedicate my life to work in libraries. I'm particularly interested in libraries in the international realm. My first master's degree, as Dr. Safe said, is in international relations. Um, so I like to look at libraries in the larger global scale to see how we can work together and how we can influence each other, influence each other and just be better and bring out the best in each other. And that's why, again, I'm just so honored to be here tonight. Currently, I am the manager of Middlesex University Dubai campus. This is not a filter, it's our actual library. Um, it's closed now, so you don't have to worry about any students sneaking up behind me. 
Um, but yeah, I'm so happy to be here. Again, this is such a critically important day. As Dr. Safe said, the right to know, access to information, the very foundation of that is health, water, food security, safety, and it's just something that's important to all of us in our communities. Okay. Uh, our our uh, session tonight will be like a dialogue. I will ask uh, some questions and uh, Dr. Dorian will uh, collaborate on these questions and uh, we welcome the but uh, participant, if you have any questions, you can uh, write them up and we will answer them uh, on the course of, uh, of this uh, talk. Uh, as you know, uh, and as you said, that information is coming more and more into our life. The importance of it is increasing. That's why the UNESCO uh, has recognized the 28th of September as the uh, International Day for Universal Access to Information. Uh, and of course, this step did not come uh, uh, like that. It, it has been a lot of uh, uh, inquiries and a lot of studies which made the, universe, the, uh, the UNESCO declare this day as a day of free access to information or universal access to information. How important is this declaration, do, do you think? Oh, it's incredibly, incredibly important. The right to know empowers individuals to become informed people who in turn make informed decisions. Thus, a public's right to know is critical for a prosperous society because the right to know supports an informed and educated participants in the society and in the, in the individuals in it. Therefore, access to information is a cornerstone of a healthy and inclusive knowledge-based society. Libraries' role in providing access to information is fundamental to this building of better and stronger societies. The right to know is a primary driver of this in so many areas, so many areas of our societies. But I'd like to go through a couple examples where I think it's most prevalent. First, the right to know with health. And unfortunately, during this time of COVID, we've seen how critically important that is. I know in the UAE, we get daily reports from the government telling us how many cases there are, how many recoveries, and things like that. And what that does is it gives people the information they need to make informed decisions about their daily activities, and that they should stay home, if they should, you know, go to the gym or not go to the gym. I'm not going to the gym, regardless of what the numbers are. Um, but they help us make the decisions about our daily life, where we should go, where we should not go. Also, by the government providing this transparent information, it helps us better understand and appreciate their directives. So, for example, we had many lockdowns and curfews, but we accepted this because we understood the reason the government was doing that. I don't know if any of you have small children, but if you tell a child to do something, the first question they ask is, why? Why? Because they want, and actually that's the first question I ask too, to be fair. Um, so, it's really important for cooperation in our societies and trust in our government and, elect and officials to have this information that they provide to us. Secondly, is with public safety. So governments are really good, especially in the Gulf, about letting people know when there's been a crime, if there's a, an emergency, like a fire or a car crash, so we can avoid those areas and make sure that our health is protected and that we're staying away from areas where medical and fire professionals need to have more space. So that's another way that the right to know and access to information is so critical to our daily lives. Next is with environmental issues. You know, Dr. Safe talked about safe water and things like that. And many companies will have to tell us what their pollutants are into our rivers and oceans and the Gulf. And research finds that the right to know is critical in sustainable develop development initiatives uh, because this data makes the uh, companies responsible because they know people are going to ask and governments will ask how many pollutants you're putting into the air, how many pollutants you're putting into the water. So they'll try to lessen that amount because they know they have to be accountable. Also, it promotes record keeping in these companies and agencies because when the government or people are asking, they know 
these companies know they have to have a repository of this information that they can share readily because they know that the public has a right to this information. And luckily, most governments also make that mandatory. Next is the preserving of historical records. Knowing our past is crucial to understanding our present and preparing for our future. So it's really important for our governments and with the help of libraries and museums, et cetera, to help preserve this information so that future generations have a right to know their past and they have access to this information. One way we can do that is through oral histories. Now, Zayed University in the United Arab Emirates has done a really great program with their undergraduate students where they are interviewing the older generation because not everyone has grandparents, they don't get to hear these stories, and they're preserving these stories for the future. That way the future can have access to their own history. Next, museums, of course, oh, the National Museum of Oman, I've been many times, it's very beautiful. And it is a premier example of sustaining your culture, the dress, cultural artifacts, things like that. So that can be preserved for the future as well. The preservation of knowledge and culture, that's really more where we as librarians come in. Uh, just like Dr. Safe, his incredible work with collecting and preserving manuscripts, preserving our history and cultivating that knowledge. So we see that the right to know is very real, not only theoretically um, and not only in our libraries, but in actually everyday life. Yes, yes. I muted myself to, so that uh, uh, the, the sound would not be noisy when you talk. A uh, small additional question to what you have said. Do you think that the, the, the available information for free is enough for people when it comes to public information? You know, I don't think it is. And luckily, in a lot of public libraries, I know um, here in the UAE, and I can't speak for Oman, uh, public libraries do have some of the paid resources, like the databases, that are so expensive available for their people. Because the databases, as we all know, is where newspaper articles, journal articles, things like that, are there, and they're updated almost daily. So that's the best really source of credible, accountable information. Um, but for people who don't have access to a public library who has those resources, and for others, I know so many people um, will say to me, oh, I found this great article, but I have to pay you know, $20 to access it, and they're never going to do that. So unfortunately, uh, publishers, and of course we know the huge publishing industry, um, really do have a hold on information and access to information, unfortunately. But for if there are any students here, I'm not sure if there are, but a great trick around this, if for some reason you don't have access to a certain resource, is to find that author on Facebook, Instagram, and send them a direct message because they will happily send you a copy of their article. And they'll probably actually make their day. I've never had anyone refuse me. Um, and everyone's actually pretty overjoyed to send it. And they can legally do that. They're allowed to do that, uh, even though it was published in a journal. They're still allowed to transmit their own individual articles if you ask them. Uh, okay. Uh, what is the role of uh, academic libraries in this, uh, in this movement? Mm. That I know. Mm. Well, I believe that the role of academic libraries in information dissemination is primarily in providing one, physical access to ideas, and two, intellectual access. Now, physical access can actually comprises many different things. First, obviously, physical resources. Print books, print journals, um, newspapers, e-journals, e-books, things like that. Um, and it's our duty to be informed practitioners, though, in regards to all of these resources. So with databases, with ebooks, they all have the capability to provide analytics. So you'll be able to look at the databases and say who's using this, who's using it, and how, and is it worth the cost of the database? So if you see that there's low usage on certain ebooks, low usage on databases, you could either... One, try and figure out what the problem is. Are you not marketing those databases well enough? Do you need to go into classrooms and say, hi, 
this is a database that does this. Should you create library guides uh, for that database? Alternatively, you may want to find a replacement. So I would encourage you. <laughs> there, I think I got muted. Uh, too many information professionals to buy our e-resources and then never look at them again. Do constantly analyze your analytics and see if they're being used. If not, promote them. And if they're still not being used, maybe replace them with something that your students or your patrons can use. Next, with the there's actually a really great Canadian uh, philosopher who said the medium is the message. And in this capacity, the medium is the books, the ebooks, the articles, our physical resources. And why that's important is because we have to be cognizant as library information professionals that a student who looks at a print copy of one book and then an e-copy of the same book will get different individual experiences and knowledges, knowledge from those two things, even though they're the same title. It's just because of the format. Some students really retain better information and cultivate knowledge with a print book. Others are happier with an e-book. And it's important as librarian professionals and academic librarians who are disseminating information to make sure we're cognizant of that and to provide both resources if possible. The next part of physical access is our space. Um, I think it's really important in libraries to have silence free areas. So many of our students tell me, I have to share a room with my brother or my uncles and it's never quiet and there's kids running around my house constantly and I desperately need quiet space. So I try not to be the mean librarian most of the time, the shh, -er. but in the silent study room, I absolutely will be because I recognize that in order for students to be successful, they need a silence place to study. So being cognizant of the spaces is also very important. And we have less um, ability to do that now because right now all of my desks are one meters apart. And I know that because I bought a tape measure and I measured every single one of them. Um, but prior and hopefully after COVID is over, you will cultivate group spaces, um, individual study rooms, things like that. Also, it's important to recognize in the physical access of libraries is students of determination, those who are differently abled, so we have a couple stand-up desks here in the library. They're electronic. They can go up and down for students who have back issues, for students who are autistic and need to move around a little more kinetically. Um, we also have desks that are handicapped and wheelchair accessible. Um, that way we can serve all students as much as we possibly can. Uh, next, it's really important with physical access to library uh, resources that you be cognizant of a person's personal circumstances. We have many students who we found out when COVID first started, they didn't have a laptop. They didn't have a computer at home. They didn't have Wi-Fi, um, things like that. So it's important to remember if you're spending a lot of your budget on e-resources to know that these students may not have access to those at home. Also something that I've found here uh, is that and actually in America as well, um, that some students are scared to borrow library resources, uh, the physical resources, because they're worried that if they ruin it, they don't have the money to pay for it. If they lose the laptop, they can't pay for it. So and look, I spilled enough coffee, coffee on library books to understand that's a very, very solid and viable fear. Um, but something that we do uh, is here is we say we have a fine forgiveness day. We coordinate it with Ramadan. We say, if you bring in cans of food, we'll clear your library fines and then give it to the Red Crescent, that kind of thing. So um, just kind of be knowledge, like aware that some students have these, these limitations and these fears um, and just try and accommodate for those if at all possible. The last part of physical access is about service. So when COVID started, we implemented a chat feature on our library website. It's been very successful. So students can access us if they need to. Email, they can come in to campus from one meter, they can talk to us. Just making yourself accessible is really important. I know a lot of students come in, they say, oh, I'm so sorry to bother you. And I say, do not apologize, please. We're here to help you. And just making sure that they're aware um, that we're here physically and we can help them. Even if it's you know chat, anything like that, we're here to help them. 
The second part of academic libraries and information dissemination is intellectual access. So this, is, this is providing educational programs and instruction in essential information literacy areas. So teaching fact checking, teaching students how to find reputable and credible sources, questioning what we read, and understanding and recognizing our own biases when we read. So one way that we do that, and I think it's pretty the same with most libraries, is we go into classes and we teach information literacy workshops. And we actually also teach external workshops as well. Prior to COVID, we had something called library-focused workshops. And we held these classes these where students could just sign up, didn't have to go to, you know, outside of the class requirements. It's just of their own time. But we set it up in the boardroom. And we had a coffee and tea service. So it really was like a stimulating uh, experience for them that they really enjoyed and cultivated the idea of intellectual access and curiosity and things like that. So again, really important part of the dissemination of information is the intellectual access because it's so important for us to cultivate an environment of learning in the academic library where imagination and creation can thrive and innovation can prosper and where questions are welcomed. The, in addition to serving the, the university community, do you extend your service to the surrounding community, the researchers, the, those who need information? Do you have normally, this uh, service? Normally, no. Um, in exceptional circumstances, obviously, if a professional from Oman emailed me and said, oh, can we use some of your resources? We would happily oblige. But just as a matter of practice for the general public, we do not. Um, but again, if there's an information professional or someone who's an expert in the field who would like our um, to access some of our things, we do make accommodations for that. Because in Sultan Kabus University, we do uh, open the uh, university libraries for researchers from the community, from different mm. uh, students who study outside or students who study in other private colleges. Uh, we do extend our service to them as part of community service that uh -huh. the university provides. Yeah, and uh, we, do, we do even uh, give them access to our electronic resources in the library. Oh, wow. And uh, it, yeah, and it, it, it does, it's, it's a very demanded, especially in, in, in certain time of the year. It's, uh, we have a lot of demanding from outside researchers. Uh, and even the, even the the high school students uh, sometimes they do use our libraries, so it's part of community that uh, yeah uh, we, we and that's we have really this practice for... how long yes, have... and we do we do uh, it's it's for a while now for I think uh, we started uh, we started uh, implementing it more more. Uh, around 10 or 15 years back when we have oh, wow. uh, private colleges open in Oman and the, some of them do not have libraries or they do not have resources enough in the libraries. So uh, researchers or students need to use the, the library resources. And the, dur during the COVID uh, thing, when the international uh, International uh, the Oman students who, who studied in international uh, universities, they came back home. Some of them continued their studies online, and uh, they were very welcome to use the university libraries. And we do extend uh, our services. We also extend so our services to, to to specialized entity in the in the in the in Oman. For example. Uh, our library, the, the Library of uh, uh, College of Economics and Political Science, we do extend our service to the economic and, uh, entity in Oman, like the Minister of Finance, uh, uh, staff and researchers, the Central Bank, the other uh, uh, specialized uh, colleges in the field. It's, so it's, it's part of... Uh, 
of uh, information dissemination and and we have we believe as we all library do that the information resources there to be used by readers and by researchers not to be kept in the library for, mm. for uh, decoration and it's uh, i mean it, it it's a very we we feel very uh, proud of this service that we are doing and the, the the university government also encouraged that a lot. They, have a lot, they did a lot of uh, uh, of uh, exceptions when it comes to to the restriction of using the library, the, the university uh, facilities at these things. So it's it's a very good thing. Uh, at this time, in this era. The information era. Do you think that we have a shortage in information in any way? Anyway? I do, absolutely. First, billions of people worldwide do not have consistent, reliable internet access, access to television, newspapers, or even access, obviously, to library services. And for people who do have access to public libraries in the developing world, sometimes those public libraries are not really public. Unfortunately, not every library is amazing as yours sounds and is open to sharing information and knowledge. I like to go to public libraries when I travel. I like to go in and see the libraries. And many times they won't let me in unless I pay a fee. Or I can provide a letter of recommendation or reference from a local university or some entity. Um, so even if people places have public libraries in developing countries, um, people may not even have access to them. A lot of times the libraries are not close to people who need them or they don't have any remote services. And even if there are um, initiatives that are done to try and provide resources to people, unfortunately in the developing world, they lack sometimes sufficient information literacy training to find relevant and factual content and know how to apply it to their everyday life. It's simply not enough to give someone a book or a tablet. They have to have the training and knowledge and understanding of how to use that to their betterment. Secondly, the oversaturation of information via the internet, we're living in an age of quantity versus quality. We are so besieged with information that it's harder than ever to find the quality information. Now, I grew up in an age without internet, I hate to say. Um, and so while obtaining information was a little more difficult, I had to get my bike and go to the library, things like that. Um, the quality was better because there were gatekeepers, publishers, members of the press, academics, etc. And so we knew that the information we were getting was usually pretty good. Now, the other side of that, though, is, of course, that when we saw something in the media, we didn't have the mechanism really to easily question it or investigate it, whereas we do now. Uh, publishers, um, who we all, I'm sure, work very closely with, we know that they are in it to make money not like us. We are in it to try and spread knowledge and information. They want to make money. And so they create books and works that will serve the majority of the population because that's how they create the most amount of money. Um, you know, it's a really interesting uh, quote, and I'm sure all of you have seen it, but they say, you know, why do you see librarians as irrelevant, irrelevant just because of Google? Do you consider doctors irrelevant because of WebMD? And the answer is no, obviously. So I think because of the oversaturation of information, there's so much that actually translates to a shortage because people are so burdened by information overload, they can't pick out the best parts. Also, numerous inter information literacy studies have found that we have an information shortage becoming an even bigger problem because of how we digest information is now different because of the vast amounts of information, because of how we view the information. So e-resources especially, I know we all are on our phone reading articles, things like that. And we constantly browse. The, the research has found that our reading habits as a population have changed in the last decade where we don't read articles anymore, we browse. And I find with books, I have to actually make myself read it because I tend to also fall into that right browse. Also, we are very selective with our content. Now we're all information professionals. And so we think, oh, I'd never do that. 
but I was watching a documentary on Netflix. And as a good librarian I am, I decided I wanted to fact check this documentary. So I pulled up a couple of reputable sites, BBC, Newsweek, and the first article said, oh yes, the documentary was correct. And I'm like, great, I really like this documentary. I want it to be correct. The next article, no, maybe it's not. And so I immediately shut that article down. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just did that. But as us as professionals are so susceptible to that as well, imagine what our students are going through. So yeah, the information shortage is definitely, definitely an issue. But how do we combat this? Um, we just have to be aware. Again, the information literacy sessions that we teach and go with our students in our academic libraries and public libraries. And we just have to train ourselves and help train others to be better connoisseurs of these vast amounts of data that we now have access to. Uh, great. Yeah. It's, it's always, uh, uh, there is always a comparison between libraries and the internet. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, you all know that when the internet start, uh, started to flourish and the uh, resources started to go in internet like uh, anything, they said, well, your libraries are, are out of, of the world. There will not be any need for libraries, for librarians anymore. But uh, fortunately, that uh, was not the case. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the more the information pop into the internet, the more is the library became important and the uh, uh, library selection became more critical. And that, as you said, what we teach to our uh, students in information literacy courses, that uh, uh, using the library resources, it's not much way than using uh, a source from Google or any other search engine where you don't uh, know how authentic is this uh, resource and how uh, Know what, how good its information and uh, and uh, can you quote it or not? Uh, when it comes to information and information bodies, uh, as you as you know that there is a lot of information association and federation of the world, including our. Uh, Money level association. What is the role that these uh, bodies should play in uh, in uh, promoting the right to know uh, to the uh, to public and to the world? Well, I think the most important thing to remember is with the coordination of the library federations and associations worldwide is that we are stronger together. Our differences are our strength. Our diversity of thought and practice unifies us in having the most broad availability of professionals who can collectively work towards our universal aims of promoting literacy, access to information, and the right to read. From a logistical perspective, um, I know when COVID started, we wanted to buy more ebooks, as many libraries did, and we purchased our ebooks um, from the UK because we are an English based campus from England. And the ebook prices were going up uh, exponentially. And it was actually documented many times in the literature about how in the UK ebook prices were going up up to 500% because they knew these publishing houses knew that they could charge that during this time when the physical libraries were closed. Now, as an individual library, we do have a pretty sizable student population in total but we don't have the power or the authority to question or push back against publishers. So that's where the coordinated efforts of associations and federations and universities and libraries working together can really say, no, um, publishers, we have a committed group here together and we're not gonna let you charge us, you know, up to 500% increase in price for eBooks. Um, so that's one way we can work together. Um, also access to information is also heavily linked to data, of course, and data protection is something as a librarian I'm very concerned about interested in because all of our students have Facebook, 
They all have Instagram. And honestly, I still don't really understand what Instagram is. I, I don't know. Um, but what I do know is that these companies are using our, are mining our students' data for profitary purposes. And so I think another role as librarians is to say, to work together and say, hi, you're not allowed to do this. And we're knowledgeable that you're doing it. And we're informing our students. And if we can do that as a collective body, as you know, the American Library Association, with the Omania Library Association, with the UAE uh, Information Literacy Network of the Gulf, if we can work together, we are a much stronger force. And ultimately, sharing information, ideas, and best practices with each other is pivotal to working towards the same goal that we all have, to providing information, access to information, to supporting the right to know. But library federations and associations working together we can learn from each other. We can develop, process, adapt, and develop together. And we can respond to various situations together. And our collective wisdom can support our universal um, commitment to the right to know. I think one of the good things that ISLA, International Federation for Labor and Information Association, has done uh, is uh, yeah, the, the, if I work with the UN to promote the information and to promote the uh, right to information to all citizens of the world. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, there was a declaration called Lyon Declaration was uh, signed in Lyon in, uh, during the, the 2000. I think it was the 2016 or so 15 mm. uh, IFLA conference in Lyon. And it was uh, taken up to, to the UN, to the General Assembly of UN, and it was, uh, uh, it went through. Uh, it was voted on and it went through in the UN, and it was a very popular uh, declaration to, 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 uh, to the right of the I think. It, this uh, the international day uh, universal access to information was one of the fruit of of that uh, work that it led with, with, with the UN. So uh, as you say that the rule is very critical and coming together is the strength. Uh, it's always a strength because the publishing industry is. Uh, growing bigger and bigger, but they never have enough, they try to get more and more <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. benefits from what they are publishing, unless there is a stand library, looking bodies, things will be more uh, worse. Uh, where does librarian stand in all of this? Well, in, uh, very apparent that we support it. <laughs> um, we need to actively support the right to know and access to information. We need to support it in practice and not just in theory. So, for example, I gave uh, the example earlier of, you know, preserving history as part of our right to know for future generations and students doing oral history projects. I know a lot of public libraries did COVID resource pages on their websites, trying to make sure that they were being actively and proactively helping their community and providing information that they knew they needed. Also really important with librarians on the right to know is identifying vulnerable populations. So people who maybe won't come to the library because we found actually like a uh, library I worked at prior, the doors were not wide enough for a wheelchair. So the student just didn't come in. Um, and so we don't, we want to avoid that and make sure that we are very aware of all of our potential patrons and to serve them as best as we can. We really have to try to saturate our communities with our solid information principles, the right to know and access to information. And we should market this. You know, how can we promote right to know? First, this webinar is an amazing example because we're discussing it here. We're connecting with other professionals. Social media, and I'm admittedly not very good on social media, but we can have, you know, I have my interns in the library help us with those kinds of things and promote and let people know that today is a very important day. As you said, uh, a, year, a couple of years ago, when the UN and IFLA worked together to create this day, um, it helped us recognize how incredibly important it is. 
And then again, just as professionals, working together, talking together, things like that, so important for the right to know. But libraries should support the right to know and access to information, obviously. But we should all use our considerable expertise to understand how to um, implement these objectives. So for example, Dr. Saith, oh, your library sounds like a dream where you welcome everyone in and you provide everyone access. I know with my library, especially with COVID, where we have all the space limitations now, we just do not have that capability. So if everyone can just do the best they can um, and just really support this really amazing initiative and work together and discuss and make these connections like we have today. Um, I really enjoyed doing this myself and I'm so happy that we could talk about this. So thank you so much. Uh, talking about social media, uh, hmm. uh, do you think that the social media have or should have uh, a tremendous role in, 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 in information dissemination, especially that now uh, almost, uh, I think the last, the, the, the last uh, uh, statistics say that uh, almost half of the more than half of the people of the world have access to a mobile phone or to a smart mm -hmm. mobile phone. And uh, you know that uh, one of the good things that you can access from a mobile phone is uh, social media apps. So don't you think that social media has a very, a very uh, good role in information dissemination? That is such a great question. Um, for me, as a professional, I am wary of the social media platforms because they are private companies and private businesses having such a big role in that. But I understand practically that it's necessary. Unfortunately, I've encountered many situations where I went to a business and I'm like, I can't find your web page. And they said, oh, go to our Instagram. I said, I don't know how to Instagram. I, I don't know how to do that. And so I think that there's a lot of people my age and older who are going to be left out because we don't understand. And I've had my the interns here. They've tried to teach me. I don't get it. Um, but I think a lot of people are going to be left out if that is a primary platform for disseminating information. Now, that being said, we may just have to, to figure it out. But we have seen that social media is a very fast and easy way for people to send and receive information, to coordinate in groups and things like that. Um, but again, I also worry about the vulnerability of populations who um, do not have Wi-Fi access as readily as we may have here in the Gulf. I know that a lot of my students here, they buy prepaid internet cards every month. And at the end of the month, if they're out, they're out. Um, but no, I think you're right. I think it is the way to go. I'm very hesitant, um, but I think it is probably the future. I think you might be muted. Yes, I am. Uh, you built us to another uh, question, which is uh, the cost of information. Uh, mm. Eventually, it's, nothing is free. Even if, if information is there, the internet, uh, in some cases, like open access and these things, but you have to pay for the internet at least. Mm -hmm. so, so is there a way around that? How can libraries help on that? Well, I'm a traditionalist. I think the printed book and printed articles are critical to our Future. And so many people want to go e-resources, e-resources. And I'm like, no, no, please remember our foundation. Remember our century of history where we have books on the shelves. We can't forget that and throw them all away just because of new electronic things. Um, but I think the publishing industry, especially in academic articles, is a little scary because academics are submitting journal articles and getting no pay for them. And then these journal articles, these just, sorry, journal title holders and the publisher are selling us these databases of these free articles that they get for free. They're selling us these databases at astronomical costs. And we all know that they're very, very high. And I find that dichotomy of academics 
giving them free content and then publishers charging us so much money. I find that very troublesome. And I hope in the future that does change, like, as you said, with open access, things like that. But even with open access, as you said, having to have internet, um, having to have a device that works, having to have a device that's, you know, has the newest capabilities. Those are all very costly things that not everyone can afford. And unfortunately, that does um, decrease the access to information that we are also promoting today. Yeah. I remember, uh, uh, in, I think it was in 2010, if I'm not uh, wrong, the Library of Congress held uh, a summit called the first summit of the book. Mm. Yes. And uh, the, the keynote speaker was uh, Dr. Ismail Siragiddin, who was the director of Alexandria Library at that time. And he spoke for around an hour and a half about the book. It was very inspiring uh, talk. And he was saying that, uh, because at that time there was a lot of, uh, when, 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 uh, when the electronic book started coming, that uh, there, is, uh, there was a strong uh, voices that the, the traditional book is gone. There will not be any printed book anymore. The electronic book will take over. So the, 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 uh, in that talk, Ismail Zaragdi was saying that the book will still there, even, even if the media have changed. But he was saying that uh, if now we can read books is from uh, more than a century, like uh, manuscripts or something. What about uh, the electronic books? How far can they go? Uh, 10 or 20 or a century? Are they going to be around? So as you said, traditional uh, books is a, a very fundamental for knowledge for information dissemination uh, we may people may call us uh, traditionalists but we that what we, what what i personally believe that the printed book will still around uh, forever forever what do you think <laughs> i absolutely agree the printed book has been for centuries upon centuries, and I don't think it's going to change, nor do I want it to. With ebooks, especially, I know, of course, Google had a big initiative of digitizing um, old texts and putting them online. But then there was issues about who owned those texts then. And if Google went out of business, or if Google decided to start charging for those texts that they're digitizing, then it's, you know, it's going to be a, create a big problem for a lot of people. So I have I worry about when private companies come into our libraries and start touching our books and things. Um, but definitely, I think books are the they're our past, they're our present, and they're definitely our future. Yeah, but on the other hand, if you look at the new generations where reading become difficult for them, mm. And they have been adapted to electronic uh, sources and electronic media and electronic uh, uh, tabs or phones or whatever they are uh, using. Uh, is the knowledge that we think of as a knowledge, is it the same? Because well, the, most of the people now are using social media. So is it the same knowledge that we are talking about when we are talking about the right to know? Oh, I don't think it is. And I, I say that because with ebooks, we know ebooks have a functionality to search within the book for a keyword. Whereas with a book, physical book, you can look in the index, but even if you find a page, you still have to go through the page. And you're still embedded in the book, whereas ebooks, you just go right to the information, and that information exists 
without the totality of the book. And it's so important to be able to have that information in perspective and in, um, but they just go right to the one thing they need and they forget about the embedding of what that information is in and what that information means outside of that one sentence. Um, and so I do think, and I think the research also supports that ebooks versus print books, there's a very different learning experience and that learning and the cultivation and access to information and knowledge actually is better with print books. Um, and I think in 20 years, people will answer your question and say, information on social media and information in ebooks and information in books is all the same. <laughs> um, I hope they don't, but I think they will. Uh, interesting thing. <laughs> A student of one came to the end, she said, uh, because I'm teaching an information literacy course, mm. and uh, the first uh, exercise is about using uh, or getting or looking for some uh, physical boxes from the library. And she was asking, can I use uh, electronic resources instead? <laughs> because I don't feel like going to the library and, using, and getting out the physical book. I said, no, you can't. Because, no. <laughs> because the main purpose of this practice or this exercise is to go to the library and uh, use uh, a traditional book. He said, but we are, we are now, no, we don't, we hardly look at our textbooks. Uh. Well, and that's the benefit of an ebook is that you can actually see. So our ebooks are also their textbooks as well, and we can see who's reading them, who's not, and so there is that culpability where they say, "Oh no, yes, miss, I read the chapter." No, you didn't, <laughs> and so that's useful. Yeah. Well, I, I think that uh, uh, the 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 need of for information will increase at, as as uh, information processing and information production gets more and more because as mm -hmm. you said now in our daily life it's are very complicated but you need to know every bit and beast of information before you are going anywhere before you are using anything before you are traveling anywhere so uh, it's uh, an ongoing demand the critical thing is uh, there is an anxiety of information. Uh, it's uh, mm -hmm. now maybe sometimes now in, in the past maybe you are uh, people are get, uh, having some difficulty some difficulty in finding the information. Now you have mm -hmm. more uh, difficulty in in going through the information that you get back, you you collect. So what is the 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 solution for that? Is there a solution in library in librarians? Hand? Well information overload is a massive problem. And I know that we in our library have tried to tackle that by uh, implementing a week zero program. So the first week of classes we go into students class and we say Hello students, we're your librarians. We know that you are very overwhelmed right now with information. You're just starting university, you're stressed out, but we're gonna just say really quickly in five or 10 minutes, don't worry, here's the library website. On the library website, we have two to three minute videos that tell you how to check out a book, how to find an ebook, how to find an article. You can look at those on your own time. And we'll be back in three or four weeks to visit your class to talk about information literacy um, protocols and to also maybe go through a research assignment that you have coming up, tell you which databases to use, how to find information. And so for us, the library, we tackle that information overload by trying to take a very psychological approach and be like, it's okay. Um, we're here for you. We're going to come back. We know you're overloaded right now. Because again, we're very aware when you are first a student, it's too much. It's just too much. And we find that approach has worked incredibly well. Um, and also by, of course, making ourselves as available as we all do. 
uh, via chat. We also do a library online orientation because we find that some students are overwhelmed. Like you said, I don't want to go to the library. So they can visit the library virtually, learn about it there. And just we try to be very flexible with students' needs and wants and limitations. I think I have Oh no, I think we lost Dr. Safe. Uh-oh. I hope all of you are doing well. I love Oman. I've visited many times. Must get gorgeous. Oh, there you are. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, I think I have unstable inter internet access. Mm. That's why it was, I was kicked out. No problem. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> I can hear you. Okay, good. Uh, great. Uh, you, you, uh, you, you mentioned something like uh, find forgiveness day. Hmm. You were you were thinking about the students or about your users. Oh, I'm so sorry. I couldn't get that. Yeah, I was I, I was inquiring about the fine forgiveness day that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. your episode. Can you elaborate on that more? I I like I, I yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we have to abide by UK law um, regarding uh, fines in universities. And so actually when a student graduates, um, their fines are waived because fines are seen as needing to be um, a, a means to have people bring items back and they shouldn't be a punishment. Um, but like I said, a lot of people don't want to do that. So if you say, hey, students, find forgiveness day every semester, you know, in exchange for something or just forgive the fines. Um, I don't find the fines are that big of a part of our budget. Um, they're actually very small, really. And forgiving the fines really does give people a good feeling about the library. And then they're not scared. They're not scared to use it um, and to take resources and things. Now, obviously, if someone breaks a laptop, they have to pay for that. Um, but, you know, if someone um, has a really overdue fines and things, and fines, we've actually been waiving them almost entirely anyway because of COVID. We had a lot of students in Abu Dhabi, they couldn't come back, they returned their books, and we were really trying to deter people from coming to campus unless they needed to until this year. So um, we've been waiving a lot of fines anyway, but the key to waiving fines, though, is to make it universal, because you don't want to have someone say, well, you waive my friends, um, but yeah, definitely be universal and waiving your fines if you choose to do so. Do we have any, do you have any additional things that you want to inspire others with? I don't think so. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'd love to have a discussion with uh, anyone in the group. Although I do know it's getting late for some of you have to be at work early tomorrow, so. Yeah. Well, uh, let me see the chat. Uh, the chat book. Uh, there are no inquiries. Okay, good. Okay, thank you very much, Dorian. Uh, thank you for your time, you. for your attention. Really, uh, uh, it was very inspiring talk that you gave, and uh, we were very glad to have you. Uh, thanks to all the participants that. Uh, have been with us uh, for the last uh, hour. Uh, you, uh, a special thanks from uh, the Omani Library Association for organizing this event. And they are thanking you as well, for, uh, for agreeing to us tonight. Uh, and wish uh, that we will uh, 
meet in person uh, soon because for a while that uh, uh, I mean even even the island events I think they are going to get very clear so I think we'll uh, today or yesterday that is it, the upcoming event be online so it seems that uh, until COVID is over completely, we will still move on with caution. That's what myself, <laughs> this is my notion, because I'm not uh, planning to go anywhere for, for any, <laughs> but for, for a few months. <laughs> uh, we'll have a good night and uh, thanks a lot. Thank you all so much. It was such a joy speaking with all of you and have a great night. Have a great night. Thank you. شكرا عبد الله شكرا دكتور بارك الله فيك ما قصرت على إدارة الحوار Thank you Dorian You're very welcome Thank you so much for having me Good night everyone Good night Good night